Welcome. How's it going, guys? So, uh, today we're going to talk to you about a POW camp. Prisoner of war camp right in our backyard. Right in our backyards, between two and 4,000 German, well, mostly high-ranking officers. Exactly. Um, they were kept there between 1941 to 1945. Yeah, and the whole thing was, well, if we capture German troops and we send them to England, what if Germany takes over England? Isn't it amazing yeah. when you think about, we have the benefit of hindsight, but back then it was a real possibility. People were really worried that right. Germans could land It was a England. legitimate fear. Yeah. So that's why they shipped them across the ocean into Canada. And, and in a Bowmanville. In Bowmanville. <laughs> I guess the thinking was, you know, what do you do in Bowmanville? Right. So it actually really started, if we rewind a little bit, in 1922, so four years after the war, uh, John H. H. Hurd, I believe yeah. the name was, he had, I think it was something around 300 acres in Bowmanville. So he donated that to the government to kind of make a school, like a yeah. private school. Yeah, it was, uh, it was well, a pretty difficult time in Canada. Yeah. I mean, you got to remember back then, there were entire towns where every male child mm -hmm. was either dead or, or wounded in, in World War One. Right. Um, so these kind of gestures, you know, trying to kind of um, piece things together, piece things together, and help yeah. the next generation. Um, you know, people were really giving back mm -hmm. in that way. And I guess Mr. Hurd decided that a, a nice boys' school would be a nice gesture. Right. And so uh, mm -hmm. he donated to uh, the Ministry of Education. Uh, and did was he donated the um, the three hundred acres? So it's actually called the Dutch Farm. He okay. don't yeah yeah. So he donated it. Uh, to the Ministry of Education okay. for a school, mm -hmm. right? Don't really know what kind of school. As far as I know, it was like a, a boys prep school. Something like that, yeah. right? And uh, in 1941, they the army kind of took over it because it was the only spot which was secluded enough where if anything happened, it yeah. wouldn't, it could be contained easily. Basically, they were concerned um, what's going to happen when we have this large contingent of German officers just mm -hmm. kind of hanging out, right? Um, and no slight to Bowman, mm -hmm. but it was uh, it was a very kind of out of the way rural right. community, right? And the way that the school was already set up, yeah. it was literally perfect. And all the army really did was they came in, they installed I think ten watchtowers, and they yeah. called it a day. Well, I know when I was in school, I always felt like I was in a prisoner of war camp. So um, I guess it just. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't big on school right but you'd be surprised like these inmates were living in a five-star hotel they were uh when you think prisoner of war camp um we're thinking about movies yeah right? and you see guys in pits in the ground with like bamboo sticks on top right. and scraps of food being thrown at their heads and right. torture and whatnot and i mean even german prisoner of war camps um first of all let's let's make a big distinction here because I know that a lot of people kind of confuse concentration camps with prisoner of war camps. Mm -hmm. Two very different things. Right. I mean, prisoner of war camps were run by the German military mm -hmm. and to varying degrees there was some level of uh, proper treatment. They were trying at least to adhere to the various conventions. Um, now, concentration camps that's just a crime against humanity. Th right. Those were those were murder factories right. uh, designed to basically you know store human beings until they were slaughtered mm -hmm. and mass. So two very different things. But even so, a prisoner of war camps. You're thinking barracks. Exactly. You're thinking cots. You're thinking right. barbed wire. Poor living conditions. Poor living conditions. Uh, you know, guard dogs and 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 everything else. Mm -hmm. um, well, these guys kind of took over a boys' prep school. Right. And. Uh, the living conditions, as far as I know, uh, were, were pretty, pretty decent. There was even a sentiment among the local residents mm -hmm. that these soldiers um, were having a better standard of living than the uh, Canadians living in the Yeah, I've heard about that too. Yeah. Well, you can think about it. World War II, um, mm -hmm. everything's being rationed, everything is in short supply. Mm -hmm. um, everybody felt that. And uh, these guys were getting only the best food, uh, you know, only the best living conditions. Right. I mean, you told me they were allowed to just walk down to the, to the so, lake. So the rule was, if, as long as you promise not to escape, they would let you go to the lake for a swim. Yeah, so this is a prisoner of war camp with the right. honor system. And that's like Canadian to the 
T. Oh, just literally. you wait. <laughs> just, just you wait with the Kennedy and when we talk about the Battle of Bowmanville. <laughs> but um, it was a pretty serious endeavor. Mm. I mean, part of the reason why it was, why it was here was because these were not your uh, common, just common, you know, grunts. These were right. officers. Um, a lot of them were Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. And they were um, between, I think at one point it was upward, it was close to 4,000. But these, is, these were guys that knew stuff. Right. And they wanted to have them close to Camp X because that's where really the hub of Intel. Allied Intel was. Right. At, at and time. I actually watched a video a little while back and I don't <clears> know how credible it is. But it was something along the lines of that these uh, these prisoners of war, that you want to call them, yeah. the Nazis, they were treated so well. So when they wrote letters back to Germany, yeah. right, to their families, it was kind of like, a, wow, the, the grass is so much greener on this side. And we're being treated so well. They aren't as bad as we think they are. So maybe we should just end this war. It was, uh, there was a huge component of, yeah. of propaganda. Because they were, because closer to 45, they were... Life in Germany got very, brutal. very brutal. Very quick, too. Very quickly. So, uh, basically, as soon as they, um, they started losing the, the war on the Eastern Front, mm-hmm. everything started going downhill very right. quickly. Um, and they kind of made this an emotional war, too, at one point, right? Um, was, well, if you look at it from the point of view, if we treat the soldiers well. Yeah. So, they wanted to basically have the letters written back home saying, look... You're starving over there. Bombs are falling mm-hmm. on your heads. And look, your own government is because I mean, you know. And look, our and the enemy government over here treats us better. Treats us so much better. They give us five course meals. Right, we're getting pretty good treatment for being prisoners. Yeah, I mean, you know, they they, they played soccer. They had uh, they had theater. They had a mm-hmm. theater troupe. They put on plays. They had a swimming pool. <laughs> a swimming pool. <laughs> um, I may or may not have. Um, I knew a guy that apparently went mm-hmm. onto the property because you're not supposed to. Oh yeah, and uh, apparently it's all vandalized. Now. It's incredibly vandalized, yeah. and it's very very sad because um, you go in there and you just feel the history around you. And I think there were uh, there were eight buildings when mm-hmm. it was actually yes, and now it's only two. There there or three. You know, the the, the place has has a history. So to give a quick synopsis, you started. You said originally. Mr. Hurd donated the property. It became a, a kind of a boys' prep school, mm-hmm. uh, and most of the facilities that were used by the prisoner of war were camp catered for basically having boys live there and right. have a good education, sound body, sound mind mm-hmm. kind of approach. Um, but when 1941 rolled around mm-hmm. and they decided to have this prisoner of war camp there, they added some barracks right. uh, for the Canadian guards. Um, and some additional living accommodations mm-hmm. for additional prisoners, um, but overall, it really didn't change that much right. from what a well-to-do Canadian family would want their young son to experience. Right, was basically what was given to the German uh, prisoners of war. Right, and these were high-ranking guys that really knew stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, the guys at Camp X definitely wanted to to pick their brains. Exactly, and uh, it was part of the big propaganda machine. And it's. Then you wonder too because they had they were guarded by the Canadian Army. They were. Right? So how many of them were actually possibly spies? Here's right? Like the guards usually have all the intel. They should, but I mean There had to be some you know going back and forth, no? When you look at it, first of all the the camp and I remember reading this, it apparently was supposed to be located in Kitchener. Mm. But Kitchener, as you may or may not know, used to be called Berlin, Ontario. It right. has a huge German population. So they said, okay, no, if one of these guys literally walks out the front door in mm-hmm. Kitchener, um, we'll never find him. Right. Everybody here speaks German. Right. And another thing that we have to remember is we have the benefit of hindsight. Mm-hmm. Hitler was a horrible monster. Mm-hmm. Um, the Nazi regime was a, a machine that... that that basically, you know, obliterated anything that was good about humanity. Right. We know that looking back. But back then, that information wasn't available. Mm-hmm. Like you have to understand that um, it was only at first, you know, rumors from the European resistance forces that there were death camps mm-hmm. in Germany and that there was uh, this mass extermination of of, uh, of various right. people in Germany. Um, 
and Germany did a pretty good job of kind of keeping that information yeah, well, I mean, classified, if you want to call it that. Everything, it, it was a oppressive mm-hmm. uh, totalitarian regime. So mm-hmm. they, they controlled the media, they controlled right. the press. Um, basically, if you were watching any kind of news coming out of Germany, you mm-hmm. had no idea what was actually going exactly. on over there. Right. We all know this now, but mm-hmm. back then, people weren't entirely certain how bad the Nazi regime was in Germany. Right. Um, so there was probably a pretty good chance that a person living in Kitchener of German descent would see this German soldier mm-hmm. and, and their take on it would be, hey, he's, he's a nice German boy just like I was right. before I came to Canada. So the, the, the opportunity for supporting these prisoners should they escape was a very real possibility. Right. So they moved it to Bowman, though. Okay. They took over to school. Can I, can I do a sidebar? Do a sidebar. Okay, so I was watching Band of Brothers for like the fourth time. Oh, that's it's, an awesome show. Yeah. I love that show. Yeah, so uh, you can watch it off HBO. If you get the, if you get Crave, get the HBO add-on, right? Mm-hmm. And then you can watch Band of Brothers. But it's about World War II. It's probably one of the best cinemat- yeah. cinemato- uh, cinematography... What's the word? Cinematic? Cinematic. There we go. Uh, one of the best cinematic uh, experiences. It is. Right? And... In one of the episodes, I think it was episode three or four, not to spoil it, but in they're in Germany. Mm-hmm. Are they? In, no, I don't think they were in Germany. Were they in Germany already by episode three, or were they still in? They uh, picked in, up pretty quickly. Uh, was it? Weren't they in by episode three? I, I was thinking they were in the Ardennes, um, in 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 Holland. Maybe. I think. Yeah. I think. So yeah. I don't. I don't think they got into Germany. Okay. Yet, Anyways, so. they captured a bunch of German troops. They did. Right. And so one of the Americans is going by, and he's kind. Of, he's talking in English, and he goes, "Oh, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from?" Right. Just trying to mm-hmm. communicate with the Germans. Yeah. And one of the guys uh, responds, yep. and he's speaking clear English. Yeah. And he goes, "Oh, whoa! You know how to speak English? Yeah. Like you have that American accent." Yeah. And he kind of goes, "Yeah, I grew up here." And the American soldier, he's like, oh, I grew up in that same town. Yeah. So the American soldier goes, why are you in Hitler's army then? Yeah. And he goes, oh, well, we got the calling that we should come back yeah. and support our own. Yeah. So they flew from America, him and his family flew from America to Germany yeah. to join their German army. Because back then it was a case of I'm going to go back and fight for my country. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people, for the most part, and, and I don't... It's patriotism in a bit. Well, it was patriotic. But they didn't know they how. They had no idea. Exactly. And I don't want to put a blanket statement out there that mm-hmm. nobody knew anything and all these guys are absolutely absolved of any right. wrongdoing uh, because the German army did commit yeah. huge atrocities and the indoctrination um, of the Nazi regime, the way that they wanted you to think mm-hmm. and the things that they considered to be good. Yeah. I mean, uh, but the, in the early parts of the war, it was very... Who's right? Who's wrong? Nobody really in, knows. Especially in North America, a lot of people didn't know. Let, yeah. Let's let's remember that well into the forties, like before Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the United States was very much on the fence about exactly. should they enter the war. Exactly. Uh, I, the the European countries were already involved in World War Two, mm-hmm. and German U boats were uh, coming into New York Harbor, and and people were going out for sightseeing tours. Right. Because. Uh, as a ship, you can spend, I believe, 48 hours in a neutral port. Oh. Um, now, you can't be given any kind of military support. Right. But you can uh, top up your water, your food supplies, and... and they know about that. Yeah. yeah. So, literally, you had Nazi sailors right. um, walking around New York when Europe was already at war with Germany. Mm-hmm. So, this is a very different time. To us, it's so obvious, it's right? It's hindsight. It's, it's hindsight. hindsight. We're looking at it, we're going, well, yes, the Germans were bad. They right. were They were this murderous... Uh, regime that that was that was killing mm-hmm. um, you know so many people every day and I mean you name it they they had a camp for it and right if you had the wrong political leanings if you were um, disabled if right. you God forbid had any kind of mental disabilities mm-hmm. um, they they were murdering people and of right. course everybody knows about uh, you know the treatment of the Jewish people right. in Germany but you got to remember they did the same thing with just about every minority that they disapproved of right and with their own yeah, yeah. we know that yeah. but back then people in canada and the united states for the most part didn't know it exactly mm-hmm. going back <laughs> yeah so, so yeah it's, it's it's very interesting so they were worried mm-hmm. uh that uh, you can have people just literally walking out of the prison right. of war camp and and just 
uh, basically being in the wind. Yeah, so Bowmanville was that perfect location where it's already set up, so it's very yeah. minimal work that needs to be done, and you can really start housing German troops. Yeah, they just put on some, put up some fences, and uh, was it nine or ten guard towers? Yeah, that was it. And, uh, and staffed it. Right. Um, for the most part, the guards didn't even have firearms. No. And no. Uh, so it was a very, <laughs> you know, very low key, um, very low key kind of situation. The interesting thing is um, the German armed forces put out what they call the commando order, mm -hmm. which basically said, look, just because you got captured, we don't care what the Geneva Convention says. We right. don't care what the Hague Convention says. Uh, basically, all those conventions that say once a soldier is captured, you know, it, it's it's their duty to just basically try to get out, but you you are not expected to fight. Mm -hmm. um, the German military put out an order and said every German soldier, regardless of whether you're captured, uh, regardless of where you are, what your kind of station in life, your situation is. It is your duty to continue fighting. Um, it is your duty to try to break out. It is your duty to try to escape, uh, try, to escape try to commit acts of sabotage. Right. Um, and when that happened, um, these officers here in Bowmanville mm -hmm. uh, wholeheartedly decided to, to enact escapes. Right. Do you want to talk about the funny one? <laughs> well, so, you know, you, you take it. Okay. You take it. So they tried to dig a tunnel, right? Right. What? I think it was under their dining hall, Yes. Right? right? So they're going through under their dining hall, they're trying to uh, build an escape, and they had full planning for, so... Right. Tunnels uh, with ventilation. Exactly, that's the crazy part. But they were taking all the dirt and they were putting it on the roof? They were putting it in the attic. In the attic. Yeah. <laughs> so, while they were digging, and it was totally mischievous, like nobody knew about nobody. it. Nobody. And, and nobody the roof caves. <laughs> <laughs> and the roof caves. Because all the dirt exactly breaks it, and that's how the that's how the guards found out. They had no clue what Zero was clue. going on, right? Until and the roof came. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what sparked the Battle of Bowmanville. The Battle of Bowmanville. Now this is probably one of the funniest battles you're ever going to hear about. I mean, first uh, let's take a second. Mm -hmm. Full respect to anybody who got hurt and injured. Mm -hmm. I know there was one guard who suffered, uh, you know, uh, brain damage because right. He got hit in the head with a jam jar. Right. Well, uh, it was kind of a revolt by between two and four thousand uh, four thousand troops. Yeah. So we don't know how many German soldiers were actually there during this battle of Bowmanville, but it's somewhere in that two thousand to four thousand range. And so when they were revolting, because they were being shackled, and I think it was a hundred of them were being shackled yeah. because of the escape plan. So this was supposed to be kind of a. Um, a show of discipline. This was supposed to be kind of. Um, we were very lenient with you guys. Yeah. Very nice, but you disobeyed us. So, you tried to exactly. escape. And so, so we're going to punish put a hundred of you in shackles for for a period of time. The Germans didn't imagine that. They yeah. didn't agree. Surprisingly, so you know, instead of putting their foot down, the the commanders of the camp went to the commanders of the inmates mm -hmm. and said you select 100 people right. to voluntarily be put in these shackles because this is a punishment for what happened and we need you to to comply and do this right well they didn't like that so they exactly. decided not to do this um eventually the guards said no 100 of you are getting shackled mm -hmm. people got shackled uh the remaining inmates didn't like it right. and thus a revolt started so they really didn't have any weapons on them, so they gathered whatever they could find. Yeah, they were, they were pulling out floorboards, right. uh, pulling uh, out pipes out of the wall. Jars. Jars of jam, which right. literally, the one of the most grievous injuries during that uh, revolt happened when a German inmate hit a Canadian guard in the head with a, with a jam jar right. and uh, broke his skull. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly unfortunate. What was that jam jar made of? Nokia? But I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't want to laugh at some guy getting his head right. caved in, but come on. It's just the way they really went out of their way. Like yeah. the German, the German uh, prisoners, they really went out of their way to get whatever they could. Whatever like they, they were they hungry to escape. But you're thinking, so what happens? Cause, right. Because I mean, you've seen enough prison movies or or you know, war movies. You watched Prison Break. Yeah. Exactly. So right. then the guards cracked down, right? Exactly. They pulled the guns out and they started uh, shooting. In they base. ended up bringing some reinforcements in. Yeah. 
So I think they ended up bringing an extra hundred. But Canadian there was no shoot. shooting. No. There was no guns. Uh, they yeah. didn't. They didn't actually really use what we would consider lethal force. Exactly. Uh, but they realized, hey, these guys. You know, they went in there to put down this revolt, but these guys had boards and sticks and pipes and. Do you want? Do you want to know what else they had? Okay. And <laughs> so the guards came in, and and this is like, Tim Hortons, please sponsor us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is where it gets a little Tim bits hockey. Okay. The guards brought in. Hockey sticks. Hockey sticks. They literally put down a revolt using hockey sticks mm -hmm. as melee weapons. Right. And so that was the Battle of Bowmanville. That was the Battle of Bowmanville. <laughs> so if somebody ever makes a comedy show and makes fun of Canada and they're like, oh, you know, they probably had an army where they attacked Germans with hockey sticks. It happened. It happened. We actually did that. Right. It right. actually happened. And the Canadians were quite outnumbered too. They were. Right? I think it was like one... There were only like a hundred something. The, there weren't very many guards, but you exactly. have to think about how it's kind of a gentlemanly war in a way. It is. Because I mean, nobody really crossed the line. No. The Canadians had every right to just go, that's it. We're just going Exactly. Because if you're caught in the act of escape, right. you're allowed by, by all the conventions mm -hmm. to be shot on sight. Because exactly. um, the minute you try to enact an escape from a POW camp, you're considered a combatant again, mm -hmm. and, and you're you know allowed to be treated like any other soldier on a battlefield, right. which means getting shot. Mm -hmm. um, but these guys... Uh, it was a gentleman's battle. It was a gentleman's battle. And, and I feel like the whole um, agreement between the Canadians and the Germans was very gentleman-like. It was. It, it was one of those things, I mean, war is hell. Let's, right. not, let's not even joke about exactly. it. Exactly. And uh, I know that a lot of people have this misconception because... Movies about World War Two were mm -hmm. made in the fifties and sixties for the most part. Now we have some new ones coming out, and mm -hmm. they're they're wonderful. But they were made in a time when Hollywood was not very gritty. Exactly, like they weren't very raw. No. And then in the mid eighties, early nineties, a lot of Vietnam movies started coming out. Right. By that point, the standards were a little bit different, and people were allowed to show some of the more horrific things that mm -hmm. were happening in war. So there's this. In the public's eye, there's this misconception that World War II was this gentlemanly war. They were very nice to each other. You know, yes, th there was fighting. People were dying. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like Vietnam when you were, you know, dying in your own filth and your right. guts spilling out of you. Well, no, that's just how Hollywood portrayed it. Mm -hmm. Because back when movies were being made about World War II, you weren't really allowed to show that level of gore. Exactly. World War II was was a horrible and incredibly incredibly violent conflict and mm. and 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 there was definitely no atrocity that any other conflict has seen that mm. that, that world war ii didn't you know cover hold my beer and watch this right um but over here we had very gentlemanly conduct mm -hmm. these were guys that were taking each other at each other's word right um these were literally you, know, you can go down the you can go down the lake and go for a swim yeah. as long as you don't try to escape they have uh they put on plays mm -hmm. uh they put on concerts they had a band a choir right. uh, a soccer team yeah um they used to swim because they had an indoor swimming pool they had an indoor swimming pool when the lake was too cold yeah it's it's mind-boggling to think of that just across the ocean yeah it's a totally different environment totally different and right. uh but that was part of what I think the Allies were trying to convey mm -hmm. uh, back to Germany. So, right. hey, look, why, why, why are you fighting this war? Mm -hmm. There's you, really you, no need to. You guys are enemy combatants, and we're treating you like this. Imagine if there was no war. Exactly. You know, exactly. Come over. You yeah. Know? I'm curious to see how much of that actually played an effect too. <laughs> you know, I, I know that the German public, uh, by and large, was. The situation in Germany after World War One mm -hmm. was very difficult. Right. Um, the Allies imposed so many tariffs and so many basically punishments on Germany for their role in World War One mm -hmm. that Germany was basically economically strangled. Right. I mean, inflation, unemployment. Mm -hmm. it, it was a third world country in terms of economy. Right. Right in the middle of. And Europe. that's also what got Hitler into power, if you think about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Because Hitler didn't just. 
get into power in the 40s, he was actually trying to get into the government since I think the 20s. Yeah. And he just seized that opportunity, if you like to call it one. Well, here's the thing. Uh, he Hitler went, was a democratically elected leader. Right. So he got into power but he by pulled the those people. Exactly. And he pulled on those strings. Like, yeah. look how economically poor we're doing. How, uh, look at what these guys are doing to us, right? right? And why are we not revolting against them? That's kind of in well, part... And, and you'll notice... That was one aspect of when it. When World War II ends, I think the winning allies, uh, to a great extent, learned a lesson right. from the Treaty of Versailles and, and what mm-hmm. they did after World War One. Because after World War One, they were very old school. Right. They went, we won, you were bad, we're going to basically shove it in your face and rub it in your face until kingdom come. Right. We're going to be paying for this. We're going to be occupying right. your industrial heartland. No uh, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. Look at after World War Two. I mean, the Western Allies... So after put, World War Two, uh, I think the Allies learned a lesson. And they decided to you know, economically help both Germany and Japan get back on their feet. They knew that their beef was really with the regime. Right. Uh, with the powers that be and not with the country itself. And exactly. And you can't create a vacuum. Exactly. And kind of getting back to where we were uh, talking about our very own backyard, right? Mm-hmm. We were talking about uh, the POW camp. And uh, it's it's so close by. It is. And it's so unfortunate that people in Durham don't know about it. People don't know about it. And it, people don't know about the history, it, right? It, and we look back at, sorry to interrupt you, but yes, yeah. we looked back at if you look back at our episode last week, we mm-hmm. talked about Camp X, and that happened five minutes away from us, mm-hmm. right? So everything happened in that same, pretty much the same area. So much history. Right. And, and simultaneously. And what do we do with it? Uh, and interconnected. And I mean, it, we wouldn't be where we are. None of this reality that we know as mm-hmm. today would look the way it does if it wasn't for the actions of the people that toiled in those places that we talked about in Camp X and in uh, the POW Camp 30 right. in Bowmanville. Um, and it literally took a last minute um, effort to get that property onto the heritage list. Mm-hmm. It was owned by a land developer. It was going to be a subdivision. Right. And I'm, I'm glad it wasn't a subdivision. No, we have lots of room to put those. There. Right. There. And we were talking about this before too in our last episode where if this was somewhere in Europe, Mm-hmm. It would definitely be a museum, mm-hmm. but it's so unfortunate that we kind of destroyed our own history. There's no respect for it. There's no no reverence for it. Mm-hmm. Most people don't know, and it's easy to point fingers and go, "Ha ha!" You know, you guys are so ignorant. You don't even know. How are you supposed to know? Who is supposed to teach exactly. you that? Because now, if you go by, what's the? It's on Lambs Road. Or Lambs Road, in exactly. Bowmanville. You take the Liberty Road exit, take it up to Highway Two. Mm-hmm. I believe you hang a right. And drive until you see Lambs Road, and then you turn left to drive for another 10-15 minutes north, and there you will see it on your left-hand side. There's a gate. Mm-hmm. Um, you see some fields. It looks kind of like a large park with some old mm-hmm. buildings in it. Um, and, and honestly, most people I know, including myself, stumbled across it by accident. I drove right. by it, and I went, what is this thing? Mm-hmm. I had to Google the address. <laughs> no, literally, I, I have no clue, and I'm, I'm a bit of a history geek. And you probably, when you Googled it, you found out that it's on that haunted house list. Yeah, uh, yeah there's people in all the creepiest places exactly. in Ontario. Like I said, a friend of mine was in there maybe <laughs> once or twice. Or wasn't. Or wink, wasn't. Wink. And uh, there, <laughs> there's no haunting. There's nothing. No. It's just a bunch of old buildings. Really, the only creepy and haunting thing about mm-hmm. it is seeing the first-hand evidence of the stupidity of the people who have gone through there, vandalized the living right. crap out of it, and burnt the buildings down. Uh, there are buildings that need to be demolished because, honestly, right. they are irreversibly damaged and they're a danger to anybody mm-hmm. who sets foot on them. Yeah, it's, that's so unfortunate. And, and that's your history. Right. There, there are kids in there setting these places on fire. Uh, they don't even know what they're burning down, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, and, like, when... When we as Canadians, we learn about history, we learn about all the stuff that happened overseas, mm-hmm. but there's so much stuff that happened right in our backyard. And, that's and it's so unfortunate that we don't learn about it, because I don't remember. This is, no, nothing, none of this was ever taught. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you, you hear about the Canadians' involvement in the world wars over there, and that's great. Right, but they did so much over here. 
and there was so much here, right in our right. backyards. And it was, it's just very unfortunate, mm-hmm. very, very unfortunate that nobody knows about it, that it took a last minute desperation move to basically get that property wrestled out from the hands of land developers, mm-hmm. who honestly give your head a shake. Like, really, do you need to make your buck in that particular place that badly? Exactly. It's premium land now. It, like, is. it is. Yeah. Everywhere around there, there are developments, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it is quite a happening part of Bowmanville, which right. is growing. It's a, it's a it pretty is. growing uh, community. But there's no reason it can't go, grow around it a site like that. Well, we were talking about this off camera as well. It's so unfortunate that the city hasn't gone in and tried to revitalize that. Because I know there is a petition going around or something along those lines. And it already took one petition just to and get it. And it's so unfortunate, like we were talking about this off camera as well, that none of these buildings have been revitalized. No. As a matter of fact, they've been vandalized and burned yeah. down. Exactly. And there's zero, well, I don't, from our point of view, there's zero support from, I guess, the community or even the city, the city of Bowmanville to kind of preserve. There are a couple of people. Mm -hmm. There's a small group of very passionate people who obviously are fighting for this. Right. Or else it wouldn't even been wrestled out of the the grip of the developers that were trying to put a subdivision on top of it. That happened because of some incredibly hard work of some Mm -hmm. very passionate people. Yeah. But hard work and passion can only take you so far. Right. Unless there's an actual support for an actual backing. They named it a heritage site. Yeah. That's only step one, really, of the 10 step process in this case. I can name you Sir Zane in the Kingdom of Peatlandia. <laughs> and honestly, that's about where it stops on paper. You're pretty much knighted in a country that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. So, you know, <laughs> uh, but it, that's what it amounts to. Right. There, nobody's allowed to do anything. No. And what I'm worried about is that th- there will be frustration to mm-hmm. boil over to the point where people around it will go, There's, this thing's an eyesore. And, well, Right now, it's to the point where there's some buildings actually still standing, right? Like and the uh, swimming hall mm-hmm. is still standing, the dining hall is standing, I think yes. a couple of the cabins, yeah. right? The guard towers, I believe, too. There are no guard towers left, but there are some of the dormitories. Right, dormitories. They were, they were there. And so those it's buildings a, can be rescued. And it's not a complete disaster. Mm-hmm. Like, you got to restore those buildings for sure. Mm-hmm. And you have to rebuild some of the buildings that, I think there was two or three, mm-hmm. that had been uh, destroyed because of arson. Yeah. But other than that, we're pretty we're on a pretty good scale. It, it's just costly. But it's history and it should be priceless. It should be. And you know, um, it's funny because this place survived uh, an uprising by, you know, several thousand German soldiers. Right. Um, it's it survived the Battle of Bowmanville. The Battle of Bowmanville. Right. The bloody battle of Bowmanville. <laughs> and so the bloody battle of Bowmanville. The Battle of Bowmanville. But it's not going to survive the indifference no. of uh, the people around us and, you know, bored kids looking for a place to break stuff, which I am absolutely certain they don't even know what they're breaking. No, that's the unfortunate part. Yeah. yeah. So, um, check the description below. We're mm-hmm. going to include all kinds of links. We want you to see the pictures of what the place looks like now, uh, pictures of what the place looked like, like before, back then. Right. Um, and uh, links to the, the foundation that is trying to keep it yeah. alive and keep it preserved. If we can find it. Um, the, there are some really hardworking, passionate people trying to do this. They but, are. Uh, hard work and passion only goes so far mm-hmm. uh, when there's no cooperation, no support from the top down, unless people like us make some noise. Exactly. Uh, All so we really uh, need is one person, the right person. The right person to kind of uh, hopefully right. be watching this and, and go, hey, this is history that deserves to be preserved, right? Exactly. Well, thank you guys so much for watching the second episode of our podcast. So we finally figured out a name. It's called the Cup of Durham Podcast. Cup of Durham Podcast. Uh, check us out on YouTube. Uh, drop us a subscription. Even one person at this point will help us immensely. We're just right. trying to grow. Uh, if you liked what you saw, leave a comment. Leave a comment. Smash the like button. We, see, we've been watching YouTube too. Smash the like button.